Welcome to Vertical City. I'm your host, Lennon Richardson. During each episode, I interview one of the world's top experts in architecture, urban design, engineering, or ecology, so that we can better understand and develop solutions for sustainable living. Thank you for listening, and get ready to join us on another groundbreaking and uplifting episode. This is Lennon Richardson with the Vertical City Podcast. I'm joined today by Daniel Safarik. Daniel is the Asian Headquarters Director of the Council on Tall Building and Urban Habitat, CTBUH, which is the world's foremost authority on tall buildings. In addition to his role as the CTBUH Asian Director, Daniel is also the editor of the CTBUH Journal and is heavily involved in marketing and media relations. He also maintains a personal blog titled Unfrozen, where he writes about architecture and urban design. Daniel holds a master's degree in architecture from the University of Oregon, which happens to be located in my home state. This interview takes place at Tongji University in Shanghai, which is known as one of, if not the top engineering school in China. It is especially noted for its architecture, urban planning, and civil engineering departments. Links to CTBUH, Daniel's bio, and projects can all be found in the notes below. Daniel, welcome. So China is currently undergoing rapid growth and they're undergoing quite a, of a building frenzy. I've heard that approximately one third of the world's tallest buildings are currently located in China. And is this a trend that you think will continue to grow? What do you see happening here in the next five to 10 years? Uh, it's, it's very difficult to predict uh, anything past five years in this industry because that is about the cycle of time that it takes to develop, design, and construct um, a tall building. Um, and actually, that's relatively fast. There are many cases where it takes closer to a decade. But judging from what we have seen, and notwithstanding arguments about you know, China's current uh, economic state and slowing growth, we have not seen any evidence that this trend of building tall, super tall, and even mega tall uh, skyscrapers is, is slowing in China. You know, it's been said that uh, people are concerned about the, the economy overall here and the slowing of growth, and they're expecting to see that reflected in, in property, but it, it so far has not happened. Uh, I think it just has to do with the overall plan, if we're going to speak about long-term plans, of the government to relocate something on the order of 250 million people from rural areas to urban areas. That more or less necessitates tall buildings of some kind. Sure. And uh, so, so far, how do you feel China's handling this growth? Are they doing a fair job considering the pressures or what can they be doing better? Well, the pressures are in some ways manufactured, uh, and in some ways they are rep- representative of global economic trends. So, all I mean, I think all cities are are struggling with this to some degree. You know, China is just the most intense and extreme laboratory for this. I think that uh, there are some issues. Um, you know, certainly if you go to historic. Uh, Chinese cities, there is less and less history to observe uh, mm. in the built environment. You know, there have been well-documented cases of destruction of traditional housing, which is dense but low rise, such as the Hutong of Beijing, to make way for fairly banal and unremarkable tower-in-the-park type developments that to westernize is something that we have only now begun to correct as a failed model. Of course, we, ha- we do have to stand back a bit and observe that Chinese society is quite different from Western society. It, it is, first of all, one that's used to dense urbanity to begin with, um, even though now we are seeing this large rural to urban migration. It is one that doesn't have the same issues with living cheek by jowl as, as some Westerners do. 
So I don't know if it's as shocking to longtime residents of China as it would be you know, to a Westerner to observe this kind of change. But even so, there is a growing sense that perhaps we should begin to preserve what's good about these high-density environments uh, that we already have and manage the growth of tall building districts so that they're well integrated with those communities. I'm seeing emerging um, sensibility about that, not only in, as you go through neighborhoods and you see plaques on older buildings that say this is heritage architecture, this is to be preserved, um, but you also see um, some developments where tall buildings are better integrated with um, the existing uh topography of uh, uses and, and, uh, and structures. So how do you think this cultural heritage is, um, would be better preserved? Is it, is it more of a change in philosophy or is it a change in technique? Uh, it is, in some ways, the philosophy has always been the same, which is that this is a much more collectivist society than what you would expect to, to find in a Western country where you know, um, the individual is more celebrated, um, and individual ambition is, is held up as the greatest thing. You know, here, I think top down planning has been the way of the land for several generations. I don't think anyone who's alive today remembers a time that was any different. What is different is the emphasis on, you know, it's, you have an authoritarian government, which is, nominally communist, but which has really changed its emphasis from, you know, collective farms and collective industry and manufacturing to something that more resembles the consumer society of the West, still with a high degree of centralized control. So parts of that philosophy have really changed and parts of it have not. How that actually manifests itself in the built environment is quite interesting. It doesn't seem like People have, I think people are simultaneously happy to, you know, in the case of residential development, move into modern, modern conveniences. You know, a lot of people, um, if you go into some of the older neighborhoods in Shanghai, you will see people living in conditions that are, um, to, again, to a Westerner, quite shocking. Um, and they're, you know, they're ordinary middle class people. Um, at least by Chinese standards, but they live in conditions that um, we would think of as being squalid. Mm -hmm. So the opportunity for them to move into modern conveniences, I think is, is, is embraced and generally valued. If people like things that are new, it's, it's definitely a strong cultural tendency, at least with this current generation. And so undeniably the tall buildings that are going up uh, are, are new. So sure. at that level, people can appreciate them. And I think they do. Um, but at another level, you know, I, I do think there is this kind of sense of, you know, regret and a, and a desire to, to push the pause button a little bit and think more carefully about how these developments are, are created. Um, you know, the better ones are those that are well integrated with um, existing investments in infrastructure and in some way um, incorporate the characteristics of the local local place where they're being developed. The ones that are not so good are the sort of cookie cutter developments that you see on the fringes of the cities, which are simply taking advantage of the fact that there is available land. Mm -hmm. Some of those are well connected to transit infrastructure. Others are extremely automobile centric and quite isolated from the, from the urbanities that they're supposed to be a part of. You can go, if you take the high speed train in either direction toward Hangzhou or uh, toward Nanjing from Shanghai, for example, you will see mile after mile of almost identical looking developments that seem to be rising out of a field Mm -hmm. That was yesterday, you know, a rice paddy or something else. Sure. I don't know how great of an environment those are to uh, to grow up in or to live in. Ostensibly, these you know, master planning occurs at such a scale here that, and I think I meant it, I meant I'm answering a question you're probably 
aiming to ask, yeah. which is, you know, what are the benefits and drawbacks of this this centrally planned yeah. approach? Absolutely. Uh, the opportunity that's really good there is that because things do happen at such a large scale and more or less by fiat from above, there is an opportunity to create wholly realized communities from whole cloth. That is plan mixed use uh, plan. This is where the subway line is going to go. This yeah. is where the street and power is going to go. This is where the grid is. You know, we'll have a, a, a residential quarter over here and a business quarter over here, and it will all be accessible. And there will be all these self-contained amenities. They, a lot of them don't seem to be executed to that plan. Um, something goes wrong in the execution where um, one part doesn't get developed until much later. Um, so you have these kind of half-built developments that are not fully realized cities, but in fact, people build the thing that they think they can sell first. Sure. And then they sell it, and then people are living in these isolated tall building communities that don't have any services. So so the execution is not always as good as the, the planning. The other problem, of course, with planning by fiat is that there's basically no citizen participation. So you get what you get. Yeah. Probably worth mentioning here is the way that, that land is apportioned. Um, it's, it's important to understanding why we are seeing such uh, unabashed uh, construction of tall buildings, and, and particularly in large clusters of 10, 12, 20, that all appear to be the same style, same size, same height. You know, a developer has a model that they that they go off of that they think they can sell, but it's also controlled by the way that land is uh, granted. So there are no property taxes. So if, if if communities want to make revenue that is involved with the built environment, okay. they have to sell the land. Mm. They sell the government actually. Well, I shouldn't say sell. The government ultimately owns all the land. They can lease in to for, you know to to nine hundred ninety nine years okay. or in perpetuity or some kind of incredibly long period of time to a developer, and they get a one time injection of cash from that sale mm-hmm. or extremely long term lease, shall we say? Okay. And the developer builds their project, and they can collect revenue on top of that. But then the opportunity after that kind of goes away to maximize, uh, you know, services to that area, you know, they don't continue to pay property taxes. So it sounds like there might actually be two different forces at play here that might have different objectives, that being the central government and then the developers. Mm -hmm. Um, I've heard you mention a couple times now, uh, profit being a major motivation and obviously, but, um, do you feel like some of these other considerations like cultural heritage and sustainability, are they being considered enough or is that something that the central government could possibly have more sway in? Well, that is one advantage of the, the central planning and, and, and the degree of, of you know, authority that uh, can be exercised. I think China is much less monolithic than outsiders are led to believe. Okay. Um, actually, the Although there are certain municipalities that are under the direct control of the central government, uh, many are kind of left to their own devices. And local authorities is as important as local culture. And the way that uh, uh, mayors are appointed, for example, um, someone who does very well in, let's say, Shenyang in four years wants to show progress. The easiest way for that person to show progress is to show the skyline changing I see. and to show all these buildings being constructed. And everyone kind of knows that that means an injection of revenue also uh-huh. by making the land developed. Then that person will hopefully get a promotion to become mayor of Harbin next, you know, sure. and do the same thing there and keep doing it. So what's happened recently with um, actually the power powers become more consolidated, um, under the current administration, and they're actually very concerned about this type of trend. You know, they, they see it as an opportunity for corruption. Mm. So they've actually put the brakes on that type of behavior, and I think they've tried to exert more central control. That could be very good for preserving 
local cultural heritage in the sense that it prevents developers from just doing whatever is most profitable overnight, yeah. you know, and then you can't, uh, you can't undo what, what's been done. Sure. Uh, in the negative sense, though, I suppose the more central it becomes, the less regionally sensitive. You would need, you would need to uh, incorporate planning restrictions such that the local characteristics would be preserved. And they, and they vary quite a lot from region to region in China. Yeah, that, that's definitely an issue. Um, and I can think of a lot of good examples of cultural contextualism that has made its way into skyscrapers, but there are probably many more bad ones. Okay. <laughs> can you share some of the good examples? Sure. Um, the, one of the buildings that, uh, just speaking on the level of an individual building, and again, my uh, experience is greatest in, in Shanghai. I have been to a few other cities in China and, of course, know of other examples. But I think both of these examples will come from Shanghai. You know, in, in terms of an individual building, the the Jin Mao Tower is actually very respected um, by architects and by the citizens and uh, generally regarded as a, a successful tall building that is specifically Chinese. You know, it's, it's kind of a... Uh, evolution of the the pointed uh, uh, towers of New York of the 1920s. Okay. In some ways, it's reminiscent of the Chrysler Building um, or the Empire State Building or classic sort of Art Deco skyscrapers. Um, you know, it was designed by an American firm, Skidmore, Owings & Merrill, but um, it also takes as its um, inspiration, you know, the pagodas and the, and the stepped uh, structures of traditional architecture, um, and it kind of fuses them together in a rather interesting combination. Um, it also incorporates um, a lot of the shapes that are um, important in, in local culture. You know, there's some circular shapes. Mm -hmm. um, it actually has an interior, which you can't tell from the outside. Um, it has a very large atrium that goes from approximately the 53rd floor to the 84th floor wow. that um, is circular. Um, and the circles are very important in, in local culture as well. Now you can't see that from the outside, but it's it's quite an elaborate building, and it's and it's been done sensitively. I think actually some more recent buildings maybe less so. Um, the only issue with that building is where it's located in general, which is Pudong. Uh, Pudong is the new development area uh, to the east side of the Huangpu River, mm -hmm. um, which is was essentially just low-rise warehouses prior to the early 1990s when it began to be developed as a new financial area. There isn't a whole lot of uh, built architecture to reference in that neighborhood. But if you go across the river to Puxi, which is west of the Huangpu River, there is a neighborhood called Xintiandi, okay. which if you walk through Xintiandi, it has all the things that... that we consider to be positive about, you know, a mixed use sort of urban environment. There is a good deal of older buildings. Um, they're called shikumen, which is uh, kind of a, actually a hybrid of Western and um, Chinese styles. Um, but they're basically row, row houses and townhouse type buildings, three and four stories. Um, they're made of brick. There's street trees that are a mm -hmm. hundred years old plus, you know, it's at a human scale, there's vitality, there's life. There's a great deal of gentrification that has occurred, hmm. uh, and it varies from street to street, but it's, it, it, it has that feeling of a living, thriving neighborhood. But it is actually um, punctuated by a number of tall buildings, which I won't say they fade into the background exactly, but there's a conscious effort made to accommodate the scale of the streets and graduate that upwards so that the presence of these tall buildings seems natural and complementary as opposed to jarring and sudden and as if they've just been dropped from space. Yeah. Um, that's very conscious, actually. Xin Tiandi is actually the work of a single developer, which was able to get control of all this land, wow. um, some of which was... You know, let's be let's be honest. I'm sure they have demolished some historically uh, appreciable 
architecture, but which would had probably become rather run down. I see. Um, but what they kept makes the impression of that neighborhood. It, it all seems very natural. It doesn't look like, well, here's something that a developer dreamed up and just imposed on yeah. the landscape. Uh, Pudong, that is less less so. Pudong is in some ways a skyscraper museum with yeah. very broad streets. And it allows you to take excellent photographs of these tall buildings from every angle because there are very few human-scaled obstructions uh, to yes. prevent you from doing so. So as a place to admire skyscrapers, it's excellent. You know, as a place to walk around and kind of window shop, not so much. Uh, but, you know, you, you see the successful integration of skyscrapers in an existing older neighborhood um, in Xintiandi, which is actually, you know, a project that's been underway since the mid-1990s. Do you know which developer that is? It's called Shui on Land Development. Okay. And they, um, they actually have a number of projects in other cities in China that have the um, Tiandi uh, suffix attached oh. to them. And I'm struggling to think of some of the other cities. I think Chongqing has one. I think Wuhan has one. Hmm. There are a few others. But they try to, I think they're a particularly sensitive um, developer. Unusual. Um, you know, not everybody sees that uh, opportunity and, and puts in the effort to um, enhance an existing environment and make it seem less sterile, but actually it's a good investment because now that's a hugely successful neighborhood where everyone wants to be, you know, they, they put in a, a man-made lake, relatively small scale, but there's like a focal point now for that neighborhood. Mm. And it also modulates, you know, the tall buildings that are on one side and the sort of traditional buildings are kind of on the other. So there's a transition that happens through a usable public space. Um, which wasn't there before. So it's certainly possible. There are other examples of this. You know, I think Hong Kong, you know, manages those transitions pretty well, although Hong Kong is, by nature, has a, had a pretty significant head start on being a vertical city. Oh, sure. Other cities in China, less so. Um, actually, if you look at Shanghai, it's actually less dense than New York City. Uh, bigger. Quite sprawling. Quite sprawling. Though. Yeah. Yeah. So there's still quite a bit of work to do in, in making, making a contextually sensitive vertical development. Okay, great. So I'm curious, um, in the Pudong district, they have the new Shanghai Tower. Yes. And um, I think in – this building is quite interesting to me personally because I think in some regards it's, it's um, sort of another specter building. But at the same time, it's also quite more sustainable than what we've seen in the past. And uh, I'm just curious as to well, how do you feel about it as far as like its, its fit and the environment and um, its ability to create a more sustainable lifestyle? Right. I think it has very strong potential. I think it is a building that is showcases a really high level of ambition, which which – something that is very difficult to realize. I, I don't know that this building could exist in, uh, in the West. You know, there's a lot of investment made in it, both from the, from the government and from, you know, private investors. I think I heard three, three billion. I think that's probably close to correct. Yeah. Yeah. That's probably about right. Um, so it's hugely ambitious. Uh, it. It's a very interesting manipulation of form, and the sky gardens are really a spectacular idea, which is yeah. where you have the double skin of the building wrapping around um, in a corkscrew fashion, and then you have slightly revolved uh, guitar pick shaped floor plates that oh, okay. that uh, rotate a few degrees around a, a solid core that you know, stays stays the same all the way from the bottom to the top. But it creates these giant spaces that are 14 stories, which bring some of the aspects of what we like about being on the ground. You know, nature, trees, good-sized trees can grow in there. A sense of spaciousness in several dimensions. I mean, I think one of the strange things about – the strange conditions about tall buildings is you can 
stand in one and have a spectacular view that's commanding. But, you know, if you're under a low ceiling um, and you only have view in one direction, it's not that different from being in an airplane. Oh, yeah. And you, you have a sense of being in your, uh, of being contained. You know, I think Shanghai Tower tries to push against that uh, by incorporating these large sky gardens um, at various critical points in the building. It also pushes forward an idea of mixed use, which is interesting. Lots of tall buildings have multiple sets of elevators so that you can reach different levels, um, some quicker than others. So you have an express Express. elevator that will go past the first 50 floors, and then you'll have to transfer at floor number 50. These sky lobbies present an opportunity for people to run into each other like they do on the street, on the ground. Um, so it rep- if you make it a nice environment, the sky lobby is less of a utilitarian place where you're just rushing from one elevator to the other, but a place where you might actually want to stop and have coffee, have a meeting, you know, recreate, use this as your lunch break. Maybe you don't have to go all the way down to the ground and go outside to get basic services. Now you're in an environment where you have that sense of openness to the environment that maybe you don't get um, from sitting in your office. So all of that is great from an environmental standpoint, not just sustainability in terms of energy performance, which the double skin facade is meant to uh, encourage, uh, but also from a a social sustainability Mm -hmm. standpoint. I mean, it, it just makes it a nice place to be. You know, I'm saying all this from the perspective of not having been in the Sky Garden yet. I have not yet. I have not actually observed it functioning, and the building is not actually, at the time of this interview, completely open yet. Uh, it's in the process of opening still. So I don't think we can judge buildings fully until they've been operational for some period of time. Fair enough. We don't really know how it will perform. Uh, it's going to depend on the uh, how many people ultimately occupy it. You know, um, If it's fully occupied, obviously it will be more efficient than if it's only minimally occupied. If they have to shut off sections of the building uh, because no one's there, I'm not sure how that will affect the functioning of the continuous uh, double skin that goes around. You know, because the idea is that you have air balance, you have hot air rising, cold air falling. But that's affected by the number of people who are in the building and mm. the warmth of their bodies yeah. and, the, and the air that they're breathing and, and the carbon dioxide that they're producing and the plants. It's all a balance, right? So it's never really been attempted at this scale before. Other buildings have done it uh, successfully, but they're much smaller. Um, you know, the Commerce Bank in uh, Frankfurt has sky gardens and you, has operable windows from the offices but Frankfurt is uh, a much more temperate environment, you know, than uh, Shanghai in the summer. You know, are those sky gardens? Are those outdoor? They're indoors. They are indoors. Well, they're indoors, but they have uh, natural ventilation, they have operable windows to I the see. outside, and then there's a second skin that uh, accompanies the offices. So the offices can open their windows to the interior environment of the sky garden. Oh, I'm referring to uh, in Frankfurt. It's That's also the case okay. in Frankfurt. Okay. It, well, I do not think there will be operable windows directly to the outside. I'm pretty certain this is the case from the Shanghai Tower okay. to the outside and for various reasons. Sure. Um, the, the massive scale of the building and the change in pressure that you experience going from the bottom to the top, I think it would be very hard to control oh, ventilation. Um, yeah. You have elevators that are that are plowing up and down through the building. That creates something called a piston effect. So it makes doors slam. You know, it pulls air through. So mm. uh, if the building is c- completely naturally ventilated, um, I think you'd have a lot of problems with pressure uh-huh. balance. And you would have a hard time air conditioning it when it's necessary yeah, to air condition. However, the... The sky gardens themselves are one layer of air that does not have to be as aggressively modulated and conditioned as it would in a self-contained you know, office floor. Mm-hmm. And then you have another layer between – there's one layer of glass between the sky garden and the outside where you have 
another opportunity to modulate temperature. Okay. So if it's, let's say, I mean, this is common in Shanghai, you say it's 90 degrees and it's 90% humidity outside. You don't want to work in that. Sure. Inside the envelope of this, the, the double skin, it could be something like 85 degrees and 70% humidity just by the nature of, you know, you have a layer of glass where you have heat that tends to want to rise. Mm-hmm. Now, toward the top of that cavity, it will be quite a bit hotter, but there's no occupancy there. Sure. It's inside this layer of glass. And then if you ventilate at the top, then a flow begins such that the cold air drops into the... This is how it's supposed to work, by the way. Not tested yet. Sure. The cold air drops into the sky garden. And so the sky garden is, yet again, somewhat more comfortable than the air that's trapped in that cavity. And then past the sky garden, you have another layer of glass where you have conditioned space, normal conditioned space mm-hmm. where you know it's sealed up, but you have the opportunity to open windows and let, let breezes in. I, I mean, the air balancing of it is very complicated is what I'm getting at. I, I don't have full command of it. Okay. But um, I think that is the reason why you don't have open windows to the outside. And then what happens when you have, you know, you have conditions that vary from the very top of the building to the bottom. It could be several degrees cooler at the top. Yeah, that's so you, interesting. You have intakes that, uh, fan-powered intakes that take in cold air from the top and distribute it downwards. The long story short is these, most of the time, tall buildings generate much more heat than uh, they, they need to be aggressively air conditioned twenty four seven. The conventional tall building needs to be aggressively air conditioned. Shanghai Tower, the way it's designed, will moderate that requirement, thus making it more sustainable than a comparable tall building of its size, of which there are very few. So, you know, you get to that level, but it's at such a scale; it remains to be seen. I think. Whether it will be truly performative. No. Yeah. Maybe we'll have to have a follow-up interview in a couple of years from yeah, now. Yeah, I mean, a, I and someone, you know, could explain, I could find someone within the organization who could explain better than I just did how that system is supposed to work. But I'm, I'm trying to describe what I think are the issues with it, as well as the benefits sure. in a general way. So the Shanghai Tower and some of these other mixed-use buildings, um, I've heard referred to as vertical cities, right. which is different than the, the um, definition that, that we tend to use within my organization, simply because they, even though they are mixed use, they don't include everything that you would, would see in a city. Right. Uh, do you think that if we are, as we continue to develop new urban forms and, and we take these types of models like the Shanghai Tower, but possibly um, expand them so that there's multiple buildings connected together. Is it something that we, we really could see a true vertical city? I think we could. And I, I, I think the, the, the vertical city is a, is a loose, is a pretty loose term that's been thrown around for, I mean, pretty much as long as there have been skyscrapers, people have talked about city within the city and, mm-hmm. and interpreted that at different levels. Uh, you know, I, I don't know that it's, it's necessarily wise to say, well, this is the definition of vertical city and, Everything else has fallen short of it so far. We haven't achieved it yet. But um, it certainly could be far more developed. I mean, I I think what most developers and designers call a vertical city now is basically a skyscraper with mixed uses um, located at different levels. And, you know, it's partitioned somewhat. And it's possible for you to travel within that building and obtain a number of services and or maintain a residence. Yeah. But it doesn't have a lot of these buildings lack that element of serendipity and horizontality that we like about the urban street where it's, Mm -hmm. I wonder what's around that corner. Yeah. You know, uh, you know, I've never been to that next block. I wonder what's over there. And then you, you, that feeling of discovery. Sure. Uh, you know, by their nature, you know, tall buildings are very highly engineered. They're very um, controlled in, in your experience of them. You can't just stick your head out the window. 
you can't just look around a corner in many cases. But those few few buildings where you've seen within one development, you have seen horizontal connections at various heights. I mean, Singapore has some of the better examples of this. And actually, there's public space at the top of a couple of critical projects uh, in Singapore, which has made a very deliberate effort to, probably the most advanced effort to bring that horizontal aspect of cultural life to the rooftops of, of buildings. We haven't seen too many examples of competing developers connecting their buildings together, which I think is the next mm-hmm. step. Oh, um, yeah. There's a little bit of that in Hong Kong where you have a Skyway system that is a, pub, a privately managed public space, but it, it's really only at the plus one level. It's, it's one level above the street. Mm. Um, it's, a, it's a mode of convenience to get people across busy streets and or to not have to deal with the sometimes very difficult weather. It's a boon for developers who have now made those skywalks kind of a uh, an asset of their buildings, um, you know, and they've, they've maintained branding throughout those mm. skywalks. And it's, it's now as desirable to have retail on the second floor or first floor in British terminology. Sure. Um, the floor above street level yeah. as the ground floor. Um, I think it's reasonable to suspect that at some point the 50th floor will be the same, assuming that we can resolve issues of getting people up there and getting them across in an efficient way and agreeing who owns these spaces, how are they maintained, how can they be used. Uh, I think that's I think that plus issues of fire exiting kind of has people a little nervous um, and has prevented them from connecting buildings at height in that way, uh, which isn't to say that it won't happen. It seems that though, if you had multiple buildings connected and there was some sort of fire issue, that it would be easier to, to exit because you'd have multiple, yeah. multiple means. Multiple means of egress, yes. as they would say. Yes, actually, it's uh, that was actually something that uh, the PhD dissertation that that our executive director wrote addressed that issue specifically. I see. Looking at uh, sky bridges as a means of alternate uh, egress in in case of fire, I think that could be developed. I think it's more just the sense that the developers don't yet see the demand to bring that retail and, and bring the community services up to the 50th or 100th floor where you can command the most, uh, you're charging the highest rent. Um, they haven't come up with a model that they think will draw people up there with the level of, uh, intensity that would be justifying those rents. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So I think it's more that than it is. I think the fire exiting issue is, is actually kind of a canard, you know, I think it's a red herring. Okay. Um, I think it can be resolved. You just need to have a protocol in place for when does this door close? When does this door open? How do you equalize pressure? I mean, all those things can be dealt with. I, I think the will, <clears throat> the commercial will has to be there first. Mm-hmm. You're in sort of a unique position at this intersection between architecture and uh, communication. And um, we've talked a bit about these new possibilities for urban forms and specific to China, but also just throughout the world, what sort of messaging do you think needs to take place in order to uh, convince the powers that be that, that it's important to explore these other types of urban forms where we have uh, different levels that people can live upon. So you can have these horizontal environments on the 50th floor, for example. Right. I think that, that uh, I think China is a good laboratory for this because not only because of the intense program of <laughs> moving people um, into urban areas at an unprecedented rate, but also because of the the level of influence that the, the government can exert if it so chooses. I think what needs to be, I think what people need to be convinced of is that there is a shared responsibility for infrastructure that extends beyond the ground floor of a building. You know, the way that, a lot of civil engineering is done and a lot of uh, code is written 
is that the responsibility of the public realm or the utilities or public services stops at the foundation of the building that is being supplied. And then from that point up, everything is, is, belongs to the owner of that building and it's their problem to solve. Of course, there are safety codes that have to be met, but there's not this sense of the city is in layers and it goes up and up. I think that is the sort of the turning point where you'll be able to start advocating. If there is a, uh, a shared understanding that the public realm continues all the way to the top of the building and it's interspersed mm-hmm. with, with private space um, and the responsibility extends throughout the, the height of the building or buildings, that is what needs to be um, – That's what people need to be convinced of. Um, How does that work exactly? Well, I think that there's a responsibility of the developers of the, of the vertical developments to show how they can contribute to the, the overall um, urban mesh, if you will, by doing things like um, doing rainwater collection and doing things that benefit life on the ground with their tall buildings so that there's a sense of collective ownership in looking up to these buildings. They're not just, you know, icons of someone's ego or the symbolism that's intended um, by raising above the plane of the earth. But instead you have a sense that your community extends up into that building. Um, And I think the strong communal culture of China and to some degree Asia in general is a great place to start that experiment. And it, it, it already does exist in some increments. I mean, again, Hong Kong is a really good example. Because of its topography and because of the proximity in which people live to their places of work and, and services and, and life, you know, it, it, it's already pretty integrated. Um, you've got this sort of escalators that go up the side of mountains mm. and, and arrive on the 20th floor of, of the skyscraper. That already exists in, in Hong Kong to some degree. It will be more difficult in a flat city that has the ability to sprawl outwards with expensive infrastructure you know, for miles and miles that the better way would be to build upwards and to integrate horizontally between those vertical elements. Uh, I think there has to be some cost, cost benefit ratio that's, that's proven. We build water towers to maintain water pressure, right? Mm -hmm. That's how water comes up out of the sink, regardless of whether we live in, you know, Oklahoma or we live in Hong Kong. That's how it works. If more tall buildings could participate in maintaining water pressure for the entire community and involve that somehow in using their height with collecting rainwater, with taking advantage of the fact that there are different temperature and humidity conditions at the top than at the bottom, that again increases the sense of, you know, collective ownership. Mm. And if it can be proven that concentration of infrastructure um, in the horizontal plane, that is moving, increasing the density of, population and uh, of infrastructure is better than sprawling out into the landscape, then the public realm and the providers of public utilities will see the benefit Mm -hmm. uh, and start to want to integrate the generation and collection of power and resources, food, water, electricity into those tall buildings. So that the, the loop is, is, if you can imagine the loop as not only being closed, but stretched upwards like a rubber band, you then have complete systems and true vertical cities like what you're talking about. Sure. But we're not, we're not there yet. I mean, like, Shanghai Tower is going to be a, a really fascinating skyscraper, and it points toward the future, but it will still be a net energy consumer. Mm-hmm. It's, it will still be a, a tremendous energy consumer. It will be much better than it could have been if it were built conventionally, but it's still pretty far from the kind of vertical city that we're talking about here, where there is uh, a closed loop of infrastructure and services 
consumption and production that happens vertically as well as horizontally. I think that the authorities need to be shown just how efficient that actually is. And it's through demonstration projects like the Shanghai Tower, which points in that direction, Mm -hmm. that I think we'll start to see it. So do you think that um, this is a message that needs to be directed towards the government officials or more towards the developers? Like who, who would be the one to pull the, the plug or pull the switch on this? Um, I, I have a hard time picturing this happening without some kind of government intervention, no matter what, uh-huh. what country you're talking about, because they're, you know, the, the government sets the rules about what type of buildings can be constructed. If they start to advocate for energy efficiency, for, uh, income equity for access to serp- to services that is more equal and on a better level of distribution, then they can start setting zoning rules such that the skyscrapers have to conform mm-hmm. to that. They will, of course, in order to not meet a huge amount of resistance from developers who've been used to doing the same thing over and over again, they will need to convince them that this is better for everyone because of the way that well, efficiency is is better for everyone. It's just getting over getting over that hurdle of not doing what you've been doing all along and doing something that's unorthodox is very difficult for mm-hmm. someone who's been making a profit doing yeah. things the other way for X number of years. So I, I definitely think government has a will have a strong hand in it, um, but it's a it's a dual effort. I mean, I think I think an organization like ours has a role to play in getting the the authorities to talk to the developers and the designers to talk to both the authorities and the developers at the same time and make them mutually cognizant of the need to to exploit and to capitalize on this trend toward urban densification that is already happening due mostly to natural forces somewhat by fiat, depending on what country you're talking about. Yeah, I think they just need to be convinced of the efficiency and, and how, it will, how will this actually work. Mm-hmm. There are many obstacles to, to still be overcome. Sure. All right, excellent. Um, did you have any just thoughts in general or, or remarks that you would like to make? Well, I definitely think that, that uh, the vertical city concept is – is going in the right direction. The flaws of skyscrapers are, are pretty well documented. They can be very isolative, um, both for the occupants and for people who are observing them from the outside. Um, oftentimes, they are only considered in terms of their place on the skyline rather than at the level of human scale. I think that has to change if they're going to be considered an appropriate typology. Going forward, you know, as uh, resources become more and more scarce, we will be looking for more efficient ways to to live. And the, the tall building definitely has a critical role to play in that. And I think that's what CTBUH and similar organizations are advocating. But it will require some creativity of thinking and some appending of predominant trends that have been going on for several generations, dispersal, you know, the gradual, uh, you know, suburbanization of the landscape. Um, we've, we're starting to see that retrench. Uh, I think, you know, in North America and in Europe, you know, people are becoming more interested in their center cities once again. In Asia, you know, it's, the suburban area has been rather short, but, but very uh, dramatically expansive. Hopefully that, you know, we, we will start to see that draw again toward the center, but it's going to have to come with better ideas than just let's replicate the same 50 story building 80 times. And that will be fine. Everyone will live in an identical, identical city that looks like a, a, a moon colony. I, I don't, I don't sure. think that's what anybody really wants. Yeah. It certainly doesn't inspire creativity. No. And at the same time, you know, I think, I think, it's okay if not every skyscraper is an icon. That devalues the individual character of a city if every skyscraper is some kind of goo that is meant to be looked at and has no relationship with 
what's happening on the ground, with the cultural values of the place where it's being built. That is also something that needs to be advocated. And, and, and again, it probably will come from the people's representative from government because it's, it is developers want to do whatever is profitable. Some are forward thinking and see the advantage in stepping back a bit and looking at the cultural characteristics of where they are and capitalizing on those to actually overall improve the environment. It's probably not the majority. So in order to get the, the majority to become uh, a little bit more enlightened, you know, organizations like ours have to work hand in hand with government and with people designing these buildings to improve the overall effect. Okay. Excellent. Um, so the CTBUH, are there any specific projects that the organization working on as a whole or here in Asia that you're, you're particularly excited about that you would like to share? Sure. Um, well, you know, I would say that the, the most effective on the ground effect uh, that we can have, you know, is, is through our working groups and our committees. Uh, so a working group is defined within CTBUH as uh, a group of professionals who come together to create a specific, I'll call it an educational outcome or an educational product. Okay. Most of the time it is a publication. It is a book. Okay. That can break into a couple different categories, like a technical guide that would be very specific uh, toward achieving uh, one aspect of success in a tall building, like maintaining green walls, for example, or uh, natural ventilation in a skyscraper, both of which are fairly new concepts. We have working groups devoted to those subjects. We also have committees, which are basically standing groups that um, produce multiple outcomes and they're always convened. That is, they're never dissolved. Mm-hmm. They're kind of standing committees. The most important one that I think speaks to the issues that we've been talking about here today uh, is the Urban Habitat and Urban Design Committee, which looks specifically at the urban spaces around tall buildings. You know, how exactly are these buildings integrated at the human scale with their surrounding environment? Do they actually enhance the environment uh, of which they are part? How, how do we generalize about how to do that? They've actually said about, um, they will be creating a book called something on the order of urban spaces around tall buildings. We haven't quite nailed the title okay. down yet, which will address that issue specifically using case studies uh, across the world. And it might sound a little bit uh, casual, but I think a big part of that the role of that group um, is something that we just completed here in uh, Shanghai and in 13 other cities around the world um, just last week, which was a summer spaces walking tour. So -hmm. twice a year now, that organization will have an open to the public walking tour of what we think are exemplary, well-designed spaces around tall buildings that are well integrated with Mm -hmm. the um, existing cultural characteristics of the cities in which they reside. That example that I just gave of Xintiandi, that was the focus of our summer spaces walking tour with CTBUH. So similar um, you know, environments um, are being explored in everywhere from Auckland to Toronto to London. So I think if that outreach and education becomes a bigger and bigger part of what we do, that goes for China and Asia as much as it does for the rest of the world. Um, you know, gradually the tide of public opinion will start to percolate into developments that match market tastes mm-hmm. and into government policies that match the desires of the people to live you know, healthy, sustainable, fulfilling lives. Great. Thank you. This has been a really uh, excellent interview. Thank you for listening to this episode of Vertical City. Learn more about the Vertical City concept and continue the conversation by visiting our website, verticalcity.org. I truly hope that you have enjoyed this episode. If you did, please subscribe to our podcast, leave a review on iTunes, and most importantly, share Vertical City with your friends and colleagues so that together we can create solutions for sustainable living. I'm Lennon Richardson, signing off for the Vertical City team. 
See you next time.